Good. Hello, everyone. Uh, I was just told that I should introduce myself, which is cool. Um, yeah, I'm a grown person. I can introduce myself. That's good. So we're going to talk about um, complexity thinking, Kinefin. And uh, then I just had a little addition, uh, why all your testing metrics suck. Um, it's one of these special subjects that I feel very, uh, uh, very passionate about because there are so many uh, bullshit metrics out there. Uh, so I want to link that to complexity thinking and see what happens. So basically, what my... Oh. Oh. All right. I will do that. There we go. So basically what I'm going to talk about is why all your testing sucks. So that's uh, just uh, <laughs> the blunt message there. So who am I? Um, my name is Ilari Hendrik Egerter. Uh, I'm the managing director of a company called House of Test. Uh, we're a consultancy company, which means that we go into other companies and tell people that they do everything wrong and that we know everything better uh, and that they should just do whatever we tell them. Um, then I'm also the VP of Marketing of the Association for Software Testing, which is a professional association for testers. And uh, because usually in my work I don't produce anything, um, I've also become a, a passionate beer brewer because that's something tangible. Uh, also gives you a lot of new friends because if you brew beer, then friends will just come to your house all the time uh, because you give them something to drink. Um, Super important to me, um, just because I'm standing here in front, that doesn't mean that I know things. Maybe I don't know anything. So this is kind of my standard disclaimer. Uh, just keep in mind that I'm a, put some Ukrainian or Russian expletive into that uh, consultant. Uh, so whatever I'm saying here, just question um, if that makes sense at all or if that applies to you. So keep your critical mind. Um, just because I say something doesn't mean that this is the truth. Cool. So we testers, we all have our particular problems that, that we uh, try to address. And uh, one thing that we testers are really good at is, is complaining. So I'm going to complain a little bit about things and um, see what, what happens there. So in testing and also in software development and in anything that, that produces software, what we are applying is uh, our methods that in other comparable situations we actually wouldn't. So there is nothing that we would do. Um, just to give an example, test cases. So um, who's a manager in here? Can I see some managers? Yeah. So how many management test case, management cases do you execute every day? Zero. Or uh, developers, who is, who's a developer in here? Develop oh, how many development cases do you execute every day? Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's just something we, we don't do, so that's just an example. But to um, link that to Kinefin, and I'm going to introduce what Kinefin is, I want to show you a short video. Let's imagine, if you can, that you've got to organize a party for a bunch of 11-year-old boys, and you want to apply the three different types of systems that apply in nature. Well, if you assume the party's chaotic, the children are acting at random, you might as well buy the drugs and alcohol so the children can go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Your house may burn down in the process, but what does that matter? All property is theft, and it was socially constructed in the first place. Um, I have friends in California who've tried this. I don't recommend it. Um, the recovery cost is high, but it's a legitimate approach. On the other hand, the one we'll be more familiar with is the ordered systems approach. Here, it's of critical importance to construct clearly articulated learning objectives in advance of the party itself. The learning objective should, of course, be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong. Ideally, you should print the learning objectives off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds and place those around the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. Um, once you've done that, you know, the senior adult can start the party with a motivational videotape after all, you don't want the children wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the objectives of the party and to show the children how pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Now, of course, the third approach, the complexity approach, is even simpler. Here, we draw a line in the sand known as a boundary in complexity theory 
And we turn to the children and say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. And one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then use catalytic probes, and I'm deliberately using the jargon of complexity theory now, a football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, something which will stimulate a pattern of activity which is called an attractor. And if it's a beneficial attractor, we stabilize it, we amplify it. If it's a negative attractor, we dampen it or destroy it fairly quickly. So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that simple phrase, we see the promise of complexity theory for organizations and government alike. All right, that was uh, Dave Snowden. He's the inventor of the sense-making framework called Kinefin. So Kinefin is a uh, Welsh word, and uh, the translation of it is a uh, place of multiple belongings. Uh, so that sounds quite esoteric, uh, but what it tries to describe is a place where a lot of things are happening and where you find yourself at home. Now, when confronted with problems, it's a good idea to have a look at, okay, what sort of problems are we exposed to and how should we solve them? Now, um, as I mentioned before, the, the, the fixation on test cases and uh, a lot of scripted things that we do um, is placing things in the wrong um, uh, place. Now, I'm not sure if there is uh, what words are for complicated or and complex in, uh, in Russian, but at least in, in the English language, very often these um, uh, words are used interchangeably. So, um, complicated, normal people speak about complicated things, it's difficult to understand. Uh, as soon as you become a manager, uh, you tend to replace the word complicated with complex, because complex sounds more educated, and so you, you just try to use another word. Um, but these uh, two words, they have different meanings. Um, so, if we look at uh, complicated, so something is complicated if it is difficult to understand. So, let's say you have a long mathematical formula, uh, and you try to solve it. So that might be a complicated problem because it's difficult to understand. You need to go through various steps and really analyze of what, what's going on. Uh, complex is something very different. Complex is, in a system view, uh, various elements that interact with each other, whereas the uh, cause and uh, effect relationship is not completely clarified, which means that you can't really analyze of if you do A, that B every time happens. Does that sound familiar with software? So you test and uh, uh, th there is something going wrong, then you repeat it, something else happens. Um, so com complex is something that happens when you don't really know uh, uh, about the causal, causal relationship. So let's go to the model, uh, the Kinefin model. So. Um, this is not the usual two-by-two two matrix, so uh, we consultants, we usually uh, either work with Venn diagrams or two-by-two two matrix because they, they look cool. Um, so the lines are a little bit different, and there are various areas, and that is a model that helps you to look at the situation and then decide, okay, what area do you find yourself in? Um, it actually consists of five areas. There's, there's a middle section, which is called disorder. So disorder is the state where you're not clear in what system you find yourself in. Um, let's have a look at what, what there is. So on the right side, you see obvious and complicated. So if you look at obvious, so these are just uh, all the plain, uh, simple things that, uh, that happen. Uh, obvious is something that we wish every projector would be, but every projector is actually complicated or is chaotic. So have you ever uh, seen a projector that where you just plug in your laptop and it just works? Uh, it doesn't exist. So if you invent a projector that uh, just works, you will make millions. So this morning, um, I did a test, of course, with which I always do with my slides, and of course nothing worked. Uh, there was no sound, there was nothing displayed. Uh, so projectors, they tend to be some, somehow in the, in the chaotic area. Um, let's have a look uh, a little bit more on, on what, what there is. So on the right side, you see ordered linear systems. These are systems that behave predictably, which means that if you do something, the outcome every single time will be the same thing. Uh, to give a uh, an obvious example, if you make a calculation 2 plus 2, the result in a, well, base 10 system will always be 4. Uh, there is no deviation from that. Um, in a complicated section, what you have there is uh, things that need a little bit more analysis to understand. You need to speak maybe to experts uh, in order to understand it, but it's, it's something that still behaves predictably and is ordered. Everything on the left side 
belongs in the complex and non-linear area, uh, which means that if you do something now, there is no guarantee that the same outcome will happen if you do it in one hour or tomorrow or under different uh, circumstances. So what you have there is all these different, different areas. Now, um, what's very important to know is that most of uh, testing in, in today's world, or at least what, what I observe, happens on the, on the right side. So we try to really analyze things and uh, also have uh, good requirements where we write test cases to it. And uh, so it's kind of we really analyze the situation and try to grasp it by applying the, 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 the complicated uh, area into how we solve a problem. Now, what you can also see here, um, there is this little wiggle here. Uh, so this is the, the cliff to chaos. So this is when companies walk through uh, their business and they think they have figured out everything and then suddenly something disruptive happens and the whole company goes into chaos. Just to give an example, who of you know the company uh, Kodak? They did films and then suddenly uh, the, yeah, yeah, the electronic cameras came along. Um, same happens to the taxi business right now. So there is Uber and Lyft. Uh, which is highly disruptive. Taxi business, they've always thought they can just remain unfriendly to, to people. I don't know how it is here with taxi drivers, but in Switzerland, taxi drivers are rude, unfriendly, and their taxis smell of pee. So that's, that's the, the usual thing. Um, they've always thought, okay, there's nothing they need to do. They uh, thought they have, uh, they're in the obvious area, and suddenly they fall in, into chaos. Uh, so this is a very dangerous area to be in because you suddenly could find yourself in a situation which is not, not very funny. There is more examples like IBM, uh, Nokia is, is another one, whereby Nokia is a bit of a special thing because Nokia is, is this chameleon, uh, chameleon of a company that just changes its, its purpose uh, constantly. Um, yeah, Nokia, I was born in Finland. I have a couple of Nokia rubber boots. So they used to produce rubber boots for children. So it's, it's quite interesting that they, they went through very, uh, uh, various areas of, uh, of that. Cool. So, how do you apply Kinefin in testing? So, whenever you're confronted with a testing task, it's, you should ask yourself, is this a predictable situation or is that something that might be more coming from the complex area where you should be acting uh, very differently than if you um, just analyze it? Let's have a look. So. In each one of the areas of uh, Kinefin, you have a way of how you should act in that system. So in the obvious, which is the, all the simple things, the very simple things that don't even need a lot of thinking and, and, and analysis, what you do there is you sense, you have a look, okay, what is it? Oh, this is a simple calculation. Then you categorize it, that's the, yeah, it's a simple calculation, and then you respond to it. You just add well, whatever there is. Um, so a world example would be on a traffic light, this is an obvious problem. So you stand in front of the, the, the traffic light, it's red, you stop, it, it turns to green, then you accelerate. Uh, that's, that's what you do. In testing, just an example, checking GUI elements. Um, so if you know that, okay, there should be a send button, there should be an entry field for the first name and second name, this is an obvious problem to solve. Doesn't need a lot of effort to, uh, to, to check these elements. So this is also all the obvious problems in testing are very open for automation. So automation is, is a good approach to solve obvious testing problems. <coughs> and very often that's what you should do with obvious testing problems. You should, you should automate them, have a machine run all that. Um, I'll come back a little bit uh, later on, on that as well. Now the complicated situation is, is more something which needs analysis. So you need to approach it analytically, which means you sense okay, what sort of situation am I in? Then you start analyzing and then you respond. When you have the outcome of your analysis, then you respond. Um, a world example of that would be building a spaceship. So a spaceship is not a trivial problem. It's something that's difficult to do. So if your plan is uh, next year I want to fly to Mars and I want to build a spaceship, uh, then you can't just take best practices and everything. You really need to analyze the situation in order to build that. Or if you have uh, kind of uh, non-trivial calculations in, in your software. Uh, if you really need to analyze that, then this is a, a complicated problem. So unfortunately in testing, um, most of the bigger challenges in testing, they do not belong in neither of these first categories. They belong into the complex category. Um, so what's the reason you do exploration with a software? What, what is the reason that you sometimes uh, don't follow your scripts or you don't automate anything, but you conduct experiments with the software. So you ask the software something, the software responds, and then you try to make sense uh, if that is good or not. Um, so complex here, we're in an area where uh, 
There, there are, are the unknown unknowns. These are things that we don't even know we don't know. Huh? So do you remember when uh, Donald Rumsfeld had this known knowns and unknown unknowns and things like that? Um, now guess where he has that from. This is from, from Dave Snowden. So he had this categorization system from Dave Snowden was exposed to um, the Kinefin model back then. Um, so here it is, it's really that this is something, at, uh, an area in testing, which by definition we can't automate. It's not possible to automate uh, complex problems in testing because very often uh, we don't have a clear view of what the desired outcome should be. What we need to do is conduct an experiment and then observe the experiment and based on the observation decide whether or not we have a problem. Huh? So this is uh, a part that is very much neglected. So it's really almost a, a everything in testing is, is, a, is a complex problem. Um, the reason why we still have bugs in, in production software is because we didn't think of something. What we humans are really good at is detecting problems when they happen. What we are really bad at is anticipating the full set of problems. So if you have any piece of software, you cannot enumerate all uh, a complete list of, of bugs that could happen. This is not possible. But any bug that is recognized as one is recognized as one immediately. So we humans are really good at that. Uh, machines can't do that. Um, so what you do in complex problems in testing is that you build a lot of experiments. You make them parallel and you see which ones are um, uh, successful. So in testing, of course, successful means, okay, we found something interesting that we need to respond to. Um, the way you do it is not uh, analyze the system and, and, and just implement everything that you can think of, but it's conducting sometimes even random experiments and see how, how does the software uh, react. Good. Uh, chaos is a state which is very temporary. There is no um, constant chaos happening. Uh, so it's, I don't know, I, I have three kids. That's why my beard is gray. Um, so kids, kids are, can be very chaotic. So there is no causal relationship whatsoever. There is no way of knowing them uh, what, 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 they, what, what is triggered. I'll give you an example with kids. Uh, my three kids, one of the uh, most insulting words they can say to each other is the word beautiful in Swiss German. Which is, I mean, wh what the hell is going on there? So if, if one child tells to the other one, just shouts at him, beautiful, then they get really angry and, and kids come to me crying that he said, uh, Amelie said, beautiful. And it, I mean, how, how do you respond to that? It's so, so as a parent, you tap the kids on the head and you try to calm them and say, yeah, it's okay. It's no problem at all. So chaotic is, is a very temporary state. It doesn't, doesn't uh, stay for a long time. Now, according to uh, Kinefin, what you do there is, you just do something. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's what you need to do is stabilize the system and see that it, it, it walks back into uh, maybe the complex area or somewhere else. So chaos is, is very temporary. Usually, if you do just something, then uh, it, it changes its nature and becomes more stable. So there it is act, and then you sense, you see, okay, what's happening, and then you respond to what, what, what's happening, and you try to find, uh, uh, get yourself out of, um, uh, of the chaotic situation. So this is typically uh, a project um, is in complete disarray. It has been promised to the customer that it will be delivered tomorrow. Uh, nothing works. Everyone is just screaming. Managers are running around and um, asking for stupid metrics. Good. So metrics. Um, what we have with metrics is, is an approach where we try to um, uh, make sense of what's happening and get some some quantitative data that will allow us to feel informed. Um, I have been a, a manager for the past 15 years, uh, which means that I can't do work. Uh, I'm useless for work. That's why I'm a manager. Uh, managers are really, really happy with metrics. So it's kind of this metrics uh, give me a warm and fuzzy feeling and uh, the sense of being informed. So especially uh, percentages. Percentages are really cool. So. If I get 80%, uh, did you certain 80 versus 20 as Pareto, so there is some philosophical uh, link to that. It's pretty cool. 80 is very nice. 80% automation, that's good. Uh, because 100%, uh, because I'm a sensible manager, I can't ask 100% why should I do that. 80% uh, is pretty good. Um, yet still, there is room for improvement. 81% uh, is, is a better number. 81.3 um, is even better. And really, really cool is 80. 1.35. That is, you know, this gives me this um, uh, sensation of very exact science and what's, what's happening. 
Now, uh, what I can recommend, and if you uh, want, I can also send you this link. It's, it's a bit long, so it's, it's kano.com, PDFs, Practical Approach to Software Metrics. I highly recommend to read through that. Um, there are several problems with, with measurements and, and metrics. Um, so one of the general problems is that what we usually want to know when we set up metrics in testing is how good is the quality? So that's, that's a, the real question that we have. Uh, how good is the, the quality that uh, we, we currently have? Now, we replace that by a quantitative measurement. So we cross boundaries of different systems. We have a qualitative question, and we try to answer it uh, through a quantitative number. Usually comes along as percentage or something. Um, so what that means is that you're not measuring the real thing. You're measuring something else. And what you hope for is that there is a correlation between the measured things and the question you actually ask. So this is a uh, what you build is a uh, so-called construct. So you build a, a quantitative construct, and you hope that this quantitative construct has a, a, a relationship to the initial question uh, that you ask, which you can measure directly. Uh, it's easy. So, uh, for instance, uh, a direct metric would be uh, counting the, the total amount of money you have in your pocket. That's very easy because it has a direct relationship. It's, it's what it is. Um, temperature is almost okay because it's just a mean value of if uh, in here it's about 23 degrees it's a very exact number and it is it is actually true whereas uh, the quantitative metrics that we have in testing they are they are usually not true and are not not uh, happening so what's also happening is that as soon as you uh, build up a measurement then the measurement uh, influences the outcome uh, so who of you have um, uh, who, who works with management by obje objectives? Who has yearly goals in here? Who ha have as manager that comes to your desk? So let's define the goals for this year, right? Probably quite many in here. Uh, so wh what do you do? You optimize towards uh, these set goals, but then you neglect other things that are not measured but would be equally important. Uh, so there is there is a big thing. Now Vladimir, just in the session before, who has been in Vladimir's session before? Uh, so I just uh, took the liberty of taking a picture of his last slide that was there, which is really good because what he tells here is that the, the way to, um, uh, to measure things is, uh, is bothersome. Some, uh, you, you need to talk to people. You need to kind of really inform yourself. It's not something that you can just spit out as a number. And uh, so that, that's uh, more effort. So this means as a, as a man I as a manager, uh, have m I, I need to put in more effort into uh, finding out what actually is going on. Um, and, of course, we manage that we don't like work, so more effort means, yeah, better not do it. Uh, let's have 81.35, which is nice and, and, and beautiful. Uh, but that's not what's going on. So, metrics usually is the application of um, the complicated area in sense making into something that is actually complex. So, quality is in itself a complex thing. So, quality in software, there is, um, uh, Jerry Weinberg said, Quality is value to a person who matters, uh, which is a quite a nice definition of what, what quality is. Quality is something that we wish for, but it's very difficult to grasp. Okay, what does it mean to have good quality in software? Does it just mean uh, no bugs or, or no one is exposed to bug? Um, usually there are internal softwares in, in, let's say, banks that the internal employees use. There, the usability of that software is horrible, but there are no bugs. So is that a good quality? Uh, is it good enough? Um, often that's, that's not the case. Uh, let's say Microsoft Word, is that a, a quality product? It's incredibly confusing because it has so many uh, possibilities to do. I don't uh, use any, most of them. Same for PowerPoint. So PowerPoint has all these gimmicks of slide changing, uh, animation, everything. Uh, it's I, I probably use 1% uh, of the capability of, um, of PowerPoint. Yet PowerPoint has all these elements and it's just confusing. Is that good quality? So very difficult to see. Um, cool. So a couple of useless metrics I have been exposed to. <laughs> and, and I'm sure some of them um, are quite familiar too as well. So it's kind of a uh, number of test cases. So what does give you? So if you tell someone, if I tell you uh, my project has 10,000 test cases, how well informed are you? So it's, the, it's, it's actually, you're, you're not, it's so on a scale on s of 0 to 10, you're actually not informed somewhere one, you're actually somewhere in minus one because it, it will give you the illusion of uh, having a, a data point that is valid. Number of test cases, the same thing as if I tell you I have 300 clothes. 
So what does it mean? 300 socks or 300 Armani suits? What, what does it mean? It has no um, comparable thing. So test cases are not a discrete uh, entity. Same thing, name, name of a number of bugs found. Uh, next one is really beautiful. So I've been in my previous um, uh, job where I was still employed as a manager. Um, I was exposed to that. So uh, I won't name the company, but what happened there is, uh, so they, they measured the degree of automation and, <laughs> and no shit. The way they, they did that is they used to have a set of test cases, say they had 100, of 100 manual test cases. And the goal was to have 80% automation, which meant that 80 of these 100 test cases should be automated. Now, th th there is so much wrong there that um, you, you need to apply Pauli's principle, which is, is not even wrong. This is not, <laughs> this is not only not correct, this is not even wrong. So it, it doesn't, doesn't uh, all the, the concepts don't even apply there. So wha why, why should that be uh, there? So that was a goal that was placed into the engineers, test engineers' heads, that they should automate 80% of the manual test cases. So of course, if you have a manual test case and you automate that, you transform it into something else. You as a human tester, if you interact with the, the software, um, uh, you will have a lot of collateral observations. Now, if you automate something, you narrow down the observation uh, uh, on, on, on the product. So that's not, not happening. Good. Also, um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you speak about coverage, you're never covering your product. You're covering a model of the product. So let's say if you have um, kind of line coverage in unit testing, then you cover the product according to the model of the product, meaning number uh, lines of code. So that, that's what you do there. It's you're never covering the product itself because any uh, non-trivial product has uh, an infinite amount of possibilities of how, how it um, interacts with, uh, with you. So there is no, um, no boundaries in, 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 in the system. There are only boundaries in models that you build of the system. Now, the last one is, is beautiful. It's kind of test progress uh, in terms of number of test cases executed. So uh, how can that be a, a progress? So wh why should uh, a, a paper entity be of any value to tell you whether or not you have uh, uh, tested well? Good. Um, then I thought, let's go to Twitter and have a, uh, ask a question. Can you tell me your most idiotic real-life testing metrics you have ever encountered? Um, and I was really curious if uh, what, what came back, so, and it did came back, so there's a, a lot of things happening here. Uh, this is beautiful. Defect, escape rate, velocity of bugs found per tester. Uh, then, it, of course, this is a classic, bugs per week per tester, so reward your testers uh, for the number of bugs they find. This is a horrible situation. Do you know the Dilbert comic, where the pointy hair boss comes and tells everyone, so I pay you $10 for every bug that you find. So wh what happens if you get $10 for each bug? Uh, of course, you find a lot of bugs. And anytime you find one bug, your first question is, how can I transform this bug into three different bugs? And just uh, uh, put them in there. So uh, it's <laughs> quite interesting stuff is going on when uh, that is happening. Um, now, this is also beautiful. Number of test steps to derive test case execution time. Uh, this is one, one thing that I encountered with a client of mine recently as well. So they did exactly that. So it's kind of, they, they had a ratio of steps towards how much time it takes to execute that test case. Uh, that's just plain stupid. Then uh, here we have uh, a couple more. So this is also nice, years of experience to judge expertise. Um, that's the thing, it's just because you have been in testing or in software development for 10 years, doesn't mean you have 10 years of, ex of experience. Maybe you just have 10 times one year of experience and you haven't progressed at all. So usually the duration of how long you have been in your job uh, is, is not really helpful in telling how good you are. So many people that have been in testing for 30 years, I find not very uh, exciting in, in their ideas and I don't think they have learned a lot. So they have maybe learned in the first two years and then they just stopped. So that, that's not very helpful. Um, there's another beautiful one. The predictive graph displaying number of defects and defects of uh, closure rate extending to the future date where there will be no defects. Isn't that beautiful? Great. Uh, this is nice. Three separate counts, one for bugs, another for defects, and a third one for errors, with endless discussions about what went where. So it's what they, <laughs> they, they even made the, the situation even artificially more complicated. They created three different uh, buckets and then endless discussions of what's, what's going on. 
No, there was one before. Oh, this is nice. Number of test cases corresponding to each separate requirement and setting the goal and the limit to five. So you can't have more test cases, but you should uh, approach it. So why five? W w what is that about? So some idiotic manager just uh, <laughs> asked their people to come up with, uh, with, with, with these crazy things. So th the, the, the whole um, uh, thread in, uh, uh, in, in when I asked this question uh, resulted in discussions and a lot of laughter, and people became very sarcastic. Uh, so at the end, it, it ended. So this, is, this was one of the last comments. So if you're unable to summon the vast powers of test certifications, then Satanism is your second best option. So y you see, uh, <laughs> I think we, we testers, we have a healthy level of sarcasm and we can, can apply it in, in, in good situations. Good, so what to do? Here's a useful metric. So a number of managers fired for asking their employees to follow idiotic metrics. <laughs> huh? Good. Uh, let's make this um, a little bit more scientific and add a temporal element per month. Uh, <laughs> And uh, let's add a little bit more uh, the causal element to it as well, per tester. So <laughs> now we have a really good one. So this, I think this would be uh, a, a nice metric uh, to follow. So <coughs> I took metrics only as an example of where uh, the way people approach um, testing problems goes in the very wrong direction. So in, in your world, if you're exposed to someone who just asked you to produce test cases or just uh, automate everything. So who has ever, uh, who works in a company whose goal is to automate 100%, to have 100% automation? Yeah, okay, w what, what does it mean? <laughs> Nobody knows. Have you asked your managers what they mean with it? And, and what do they tell? So it's what, what most likely happens is that they uh, engage in a circular argument, uh, which means, uh, yeah, 100%, that means just everything. Uh, and then when you, m when you ask, okay, what, what does everything mean? They say, well, of course, 100%. Uh, so, but 100% of what? So you, you need to have a reference of what that means. Uh, is that just the functional steps? Uh, bugs usually not, do not happen or are not detected through automation. They're uh, detected while you develop your automation. So uh, who has experience while you were uh, building your test scripts, you found a lot of bugs, right? I'm, I'm sure many of you have that experiment. And then as soon as you have your regression suite in place, it is still important because it, it acts as a detection mechanism that will uh, allow to see whether or not something goes wrong. Uh, but it's, it no longer catches any bugs. So the new bugs are found through experiments, things no one has thought of. Uh, so um, th the reason why we, we have bugs in the product is because there is no way of building um, uh, defect-free software. Uh, there is absolutely no, no way to do that. You, you simply can't do that. And the reason for that is because most of these elements belong into the complex area, according to Kinefin. So you have th there are unknown unknowns, things that you don't even know that you don't know. Can I give you an example? So things, there is absolutely no way that you know that, but you will detect it immediately as a problem. Um, let's imagine we assembled a list of potential problems in this room. So we could start, okay, the projector could uh, switch off, uh, the cameraman could stumble over his camera and uh, there would be laughter, uh, there could be a, a pipe leaking and water coming in. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of light could go out, uh, it could get incredibly hot. So even if the whole room here, uh, everyone just participated in a, um, in a brainstorming sessions and tried to identify every single problem. Now the following one uh, would not be on your list. Airplane starts from uh, the airport here. Uh, it has a circus elephant aboard. Um, there is a deep pressurization event. Uh, the door slams open, elephant out into this window. Now you would probably agree with me that this is an instance of things that can go wrong in this room. Yet, no one would ever put that on a list in brainstorming. Uh, you, you just wouldn't do that, but you recognize it as such uh, uh, immediately. So why is that so? We are really good at detecting complex problems when they happen, and we are shit or unable or it's impossible to uh, foresee every complex problem that can arise. So that's not uh, what we can do. So, call to action. Uh, what I recommend, um, go to, to YouTube, there is uh, a lot of uh, very excellent videos uh, about the Kinefin model and its application in various uh, areas. Um, th these are usually very pleasurable videos to watch because the, the video you, you saw about the birthday party, um, 
so he's a very humorous person. Uh, he is super smart and talks about Kinefin for a lot. So you find a lot of um, videos on, online. So Kinefin, just put that into YouTube and you find a lot of videos. Then um, he also does workshops on, on Kinefin. I can highly recommend them. So if you really want to feel intellectually stupid and inept, uh, go to Dave Snowden's uh, workshops because the density of the material is just crazy. And so you feel exhausted after the workshop. I can really recommend that uh, to <coughs> understand complexity. Then um, also keep in mind that most testing problems uh, really are belonging to complex area. So usually the ordered uh, uh, linear problems in testing, they are very trivial uh, and easy to solve. There is no, no problem in solving them. But the complex uh, problems are the ones that are difficult to find. Uh, then of course, so if you have a manager, uh, push, just push back. Um, one thing that you can always do is um, when you're confronted with stupidity, usually this comes along in the flavor of bureaucracy or bureaucratic mindset. Now, you, you can't find uh, bureaucracy with uh, pushing back directly. It's, uh, you need to fake agree and then just innocently ask questions. So the application of Socratic questioning, uh, if you're asked with, uh, to do something stupid, qu uh, quite helps. So it's kind of, yeah, 100% automation. This is very, very cool. Um, so wh what, what calculation mechanisms should we implement to, to, uh, to see when we're finished? So And just keep on asking questions until your manager will contradict him or herself, uh, and by then they will know that they ask something, um, something really stupid. Cool. Um, then I'm almost finished, so I just want to wish you good luck in your testing journey. Um, I want to use the last five minutes to have a little bit of discussion and questions, so uh, please. Yes. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you said the phrase good enough in the middle of the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you never showed anything regarding what is good enough uh, from the magic point. Yes. So uh, I waited for that uh, because good enough, it's a good criteri criteria, it's a scientific yes. term. Do Can you shortly describe what is good enough from your point. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, for the question, which goes very, very deep into the core of things of why it makes it so difficult. So there is um, the element of satisfying something. Satisfying is doing something until it's good enough. Now, how do you know if you have reached the, the good enough state? Now, again, as a manager, what I would ask for is, is a quantitative number that will tell me if it's above 80, then it's fine, then it's good enough. If it's below 80, it's not yet good enough. Now, Unfortunately, it's not so simple. The only way that is known to me, if I'm uh, intellectually honest, is your own personal judgment as a professional. So I think your own personal uh, judgment as a test professional should be the measurement device if something is good enough or not, which means that your manager should ask you, do you think it is good enough? And then you think about uh, 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 the, the problem, and if you come to the conclusion it's good enough, then it's good enough. Now, this is a very unsatisfactory answer, of course, because uh, it, it really uh, it is based on your judgment. And your judgment is, by its nature, heuristic, and you, you can't apply any, any number. So the good enough, I can't give you a simple answer to that. But um, uh, um, try to appeal to your personal professional judgment. They hired you because you're a professional, and so you uh, develop the professional judgment, and that's why they pay you a lot of money for what you do, because you have professional judgment, and they should rely on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, here in front. Uh, okay, you tell interesting things, uh, different uh, way of thinking, okay. But uh, the question is, what you can really recommend to do in testing in concrete uh, examples, mm -hmm. in concrete uh, tasks, I mean, what uh, can we measure? What, how c uh, we should test application to be better, not in that uh, stupid metrics as you yes. told about. Um, what I believe in is that if you really want to know how good your software is, ask people who use it and make a qualitative study out of it, uh, which which is very uh, needs a lot of effort. So you ask them, 
uh, how easy is it to use, how long did it take you to do that, and then out of these answers you can derive some meanings. Um, this is a, a long path, it's, there is just no way around it. Now in terms of concrete steps in, in testing, so usually what, what uh, we do in testing, so th there is this, this uh, model of where we participate systems into uh, manual or automated testing. So that's another thing we humans like, binary uh, categorization systems, it's either this or something else and not something in between. Now, manual and automated testing are categories that are not really helpful in the same way as they wouldn't be helpful for software development. So are you a manual software developer or are you an automated software developer? I mean, this question wouldn't make sense at all because the element that's included there is, is your, uh, uh, your brain. Your brain is the important element there. But basically, if you have something where uh, you, you do the so-called manual testing where it just follows scripts, ask yourself if you can apply that to uh, finding interesting problems in the software, uh, or if more an experimental, exploratory testing approach would be, would be better. Now, as soon as you have understood uh, a problem within a piece of software really, really well, uh, then it actually moves from the complex area to the complicated, which means you can start to automate things. Uh, so as soon as you have a, a, a very good grasp that you can automate something, then do that. But also keep in mind that just because you automate uh, an area of your software, that doesn't mean there can't be any bugs there. It will just um, uh, act as a safety net. So that's, that's how you can uh, apply that. So, um, so basically what um, many consultants do, they have a solution and then they just uh, force feed it to the problem. So they have their standard solution, they apply it to everything. But understanding of the problem comes first, so gather your data first and then decide what you're doing with it. I'm not sure if that is helpful. Good, okay, thank you. There's one back there. Hi, my name is Crystal LaFord. I'm from Restaurant Magic. Um, the reason why I'm here is because I am an agile coach and I've been coaching in this environment for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here with a brand new team that I'm building and um, it's a younger team that believes in um, ISTQB. They swallowed ISTQB whole and believes that metrics are the way to go. I'm trying to teach them that metrics are crap. Um, mm -hmm. And so what do you suggest for a younger team the direction that I want to push them in mm. to talk about things like a balance in automation and a balance in manual testing, um, mm. how to output things that have value mm -hmm. over numbers. Okay, so uh, I have a very uh, specific opinion on ISTQB um, and it's not very favorable. Um, now, what you can do is uh, usually fighting against something that people believe in is not very helpful. You, you need to kind of circumvent it and do some jiu-jitsu uh, with it. And the jiu-jitsu there is expose them to new ideas. Uh, so if you give me, your co I send you a couple of links uh, with, with areas that they can just go and read. So there is uh, an organization in the UK called Ministry of Testing, which is brilliant. Uh, there, is th there are a lot of um, uh, Slack groups in testing. And things. So if you, if you I can send you uh, a, a link list with, with all that. Now what you can do is just e expose them to that and then see ha what happens. Um, now what you and then if, if they have to be exposed to a little bit of new ideas, what you can also ask is, hmm, okay, I think it be certification. So how long, how many, how many years did you study to pass your exam? Uh, which is stupid because it's three days. Uh, uh, and, and then also ask them, so how many problems in the world have one right answer? outside of pure mathematics. And even there is often pl m one and minus one, so there, there's more than one answer. Uh, so you, you can do that. Then you can compare it to other professions like uh, uh, medical doctors is a good one or uh, airline pilots is another good one. So medical doctors, they go to, to university for five years, then they have their, their degree, and then they go into a 10 year long apprenticeship in a hospital. They're not, they're not the chief doctors yet, uh, but they, go through an apprenticeship, which means that the skill acquisition is a thing that takes years to comply. Just because you have a piece of paper that costs you a lot of money doesn't mean you're uh, a, a skilled uh, practitioner. But I, I wouldn't fight their belief in ICB, uh, kind of uh, add some corrosive elements to it, to their own beliefs, and then just let it, let it happen. Right. The end, yeah, that was the end. Thank you very much for coming. I'm still around, just if you want to talk to me, I'm here. Thank you.